in environments, uh, approximately 1,900 households participated in phase two of the DP Grows program. Uh, and each participant received one root bag, uh, but seed potato, and a package of zucchini seeds. Uh, residents are encouraged to track their progress on their social media accounts and utilize the hashtag GP Grows. Uh, as well, um, planting is underway for phase three. Phase three isn't one for public participation, but is something that we're utilizing our orchards for, for some additional um, produce. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Councillor Thiessen, as the ambassador of the program, will also be involved in developing uh, some videos with our park staff. Tomorrow. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how everything turns out. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure it'll be great. Uh, in uh, engineering services, uh, we've posted the uh, Crystal Ridge Road and additional overlays RFP, and that's a result of the capital budget changes we made. Uh, as well, we've awarded the 2020 Catch Basin Manhole Repair Program, as well as the Road Rehab Phase 4, which is 116th Street, uh, north of 84th Avenue, up towards 97th Ave, as well as uh, 108th Street uh, near Can 4, uh, as well as some storm work that'll happen there. Um, some construction you've probably already seen around town in the College Park area, where I think it's 106th Street. Uh, they're doing a mill and fill in that area. Moving on to transportation, uh, we have uh, received our new asphalt compactor and paver. This is a replacement of previous equipment, uh, but this uh, will start to do some of the work uh, this year now that we the asphalt plants have opened up as of this week. Uh, street sweeping, we completed or will complete the first round of priority two roads by the end of this week and we'll start the residential roads uh, June 1st. Uh, you should see line painting start on the bypass this week, uh, followed by the lateral painting on a number of uh, facility uh, parking lots. And the lateral painting are things like stop lines, crosswalks, and, and those types of uh, things that are part linear markings for vehicles. In parks, uh, we have, uh, have our mowing program fully underway. As well, there is shale going down on Diamond 5 in South Bear Creek. and. Uh, uh, finally, we have our autonomous snowbot converted into our lawn mowing machine, and it has been diligently working this week on the CKC fields, and uh, it is working quite well. Um, we uh, had a few things to work out the first day uh, from a programming level, but uh, the second field we brought it to, uh, I don't think they had to do any input in into it, and it uh, just worked. So we're quite impressed, and that's my update. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions for Director Glavin? Well, not seeing anything. Thank you for the update. We appreciate it. And we'll move on to item 1.2, cannabis reporting requirements. And I understand that we've got a delegation who's going to speak to this. So what mm -hmm. I'll ask is I'll ask Mr. Johnson to uh, present his report, and then we can ask questions of him. Then I'll invite the delegation to speak, and we can ask questions of them. And I just ask that we save any motions or debate we might have until after the delegation's been able to have their say. Um, so, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Um, <clears throat> in an effort to help committee set a record for shortest committee time ever, I'm going to let the report pretty much stand for itself. I would like to add a few things that I did leave out of the report. Um, first off, I'd like to thank all the retailers that we spoke with. We had quite a bit of communication with them, working with them, trying to find out what the most uh, useful metric might be. Uh, we had a lot of discussions about what would be uh, easy for them to produce and, and what their challenges are as well as their concerns and they've been very uh, cooperative and, and pleasant to deal with. So I'd like to thank everyone that we talked to. And secondly, um, one thing that I noticed that I was a little remiss in noting in my report is that um, as far as options are concerned, if committee uh, were to uh, maintain this requirement and direct administration to continue to require this info, then obviously we're getting into an enforcement type situation where we would be saying to retailers, we do need this information and if you are unable to, or if you are unwilling to provide it, then we, we would be forced into uh, using enforcement measures in the business license bylaw. So, 
Um, obviously, our recommendation is to discontinue requesting the sales information from retailers. And in doing that, um, we could amend the business license bylaw immediately, but we also intend to uh, fully replace the business license bylaw and we could uh, simply change it at that time. Uh, and in the meantime, just ignore that provision of the business license bylaw. Um, if committee or council has any, or if committee has any questions for me, I'm more than willing to answer them. Great. Is there anybody from committee or council who's got questions for, for Mr. Johnson? In that case, I see that we've got our delegation here, and I know we got to hear from you folks a couple weeks ago, but for the benefit of others who might be watching this, if you just please introduce yourselves, and then we'd love to hear what you have to think. Council, how are we doing today? Uh, I'm Levon Pearson from Spearleaf and this is Shannon LaPrairie. Um, yeah, basically, uh, we just wanted to uh, touch base and say that we basically read Joe's report there and we pretty much agree with everything he said. And uh, I know I don't want to beat a dead horse. I know you guys all know we all feel about it. But uh, yeah, we just wanted to show our face and make, make it known that we're still very much in, in, uh, interested in the resolve of this. Well, thank you for taking the time to join our meeting. We appreciate it. Uh, just looking around at council and committee and seeing if anybody has any questions. Great. Well, thank you, thank you again for coming here and being available if we did have questions. I really appreciate it. And what I'd ask you to do is you're welcome to keep on listening in, but maybe just turn off your screen so that we can have our debate and our discussion. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, is there... Any, yeah, so any motions that anybody would like to make coming out of this? Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Bressy. Um, I, I will make the motion as it's presented, um, and I'll do it in, in one part. So I would move that the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee direct administration to discontinue requesting sales information from cannabis retailers and to amend the business license bylaw to remove requirement for cannabis sales reporting. Uh, just speaking to this motion, uh, originally, uh, we had asked for this data to be collected, uh, as touched on in the report, uh, so that we could use it as an instrument to help lobby the province for a cannabis revenue sales, or at least to have a justifier so we could have an ask. Um, it doesn't appear uh, that that will help us in, in our cause, at least, is obtaining cannabis-related uh, revenue. And it's also created a, a big burden on our local businesses that sort of sets them apart, as they said in the council delegation earlier, uh, from other similar retailers such as alcohol sales. So, uh, just to level the playing field, I think this is a I think this is a, a good move for us to go back on and change. And uh, I'd like to thank the delegation and administration for their work and input on this. Thanks. Is there any debate on that motion? So the, so the motion would be to, uh, as presented in the report, which is to direct administration not to request the sales information for now, and then also to bring bylaws amendments to council so it permanently isn't required anymore. Well, I know for me speaking to it, I'd, I'll definitely be supporting the motion. And I know that this was a point where we were putting this bylaw in. I went back and watched the meetings, and I know the understanding we had back then was that retailers would just be giving us a simple number that they were already creating for AGLC. And, I'd still be supporting us collecting this information if it was just that literally about two minutes of work once a quarter we were asking for. But since it's not that, I don't see the need to put this burden on our businesses. And also I'd note that our funding framework has changed so much over the last couple of years in terms of so many revenue sources being removed from municipalities. This is not at the top of my advocacy list any anymore. So I think this is a good recommendation to adapt with the times. Not seeing any anybody else trying to get in the queue, so all in favor of the motion. And that motion carries unanimously. Great, uh, thank you. And then moving, or is there any other business arising from this? Great, well then moving on to item 1.3, we've got home-based business signs and a verbal update from Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bressy. The current regulations for home-based businesses allow for one non-illuminated sign of approximately 0 0.3 square meters, which is approximately three square feet, so one foot by three foot. Uh, again, non-illuminated. Um, there, there was a request for some options for allowing for additional signage um, during the 
pandemic where home businesses were, uh, certain businesses were not able to participate in their usual venues and they had asked uh, committee members if there were any options for additional signage. Um, <clears throat> while a municipality is not required to enforce any of its bylaws, this is the blind eye approach, um, inviting people to contravene any bylaw is recommended against. So that leaves two options. One would be to uh, ask individuals to apply for a variance and maybe provide certain guidelines as to how committee or council would like us to deviate from the current regulations in issuing these variances. Uh, so I, I certainly provide some recommendations on, on that. Um, and then the other option is to amend the land use bylaw to include a temporary provision to allow for additional signage. Um, so I'm available for questions, if you have any questions in, in, on those options. Um, a question I've got, oh, sorry, Councillor Blackburn, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, Joe, which would be the more cumbersome, asking for or making a change to the land use bylaw. Thank you, Chair Bresci. To answer Councillor Blackburn's question, the the option for applying for the variance would be uh, cumbersome to the applicant and that they'd have to fill out um, an application for a variance, uh, pay the variance fee. And it, it is also uh, truthfully um, a bit of a, a quite a bit of work for administration and that we have to notify adjacent place ads in the newspaper advertise on our website and so forth so in terms of kind of a uh, um, a bit of a, yeah I think probably the amending the land use bylaw would be quicker or not quicker it would be uh, it would take a little longer to implement but once it's implemented then um, then there's no requirement for uh, running variance applications every time we do something. Um, a, a question. A question I've got is for in terms of variance applications, do we have the ability to offer a time limited variance, or if a variance was granted, would they have that right to display that sign for as long as they had the business? Uh, Chair Bressy, the uh, the development authority always has the opportunity to issue temporary development permits. You could issue a variance with a time, a specified time frame. Great. And then another question I had is if we, if we did ask you to bring bylaw, land use bylaw amendments forward, what's the kind of minimum time that that would, that that would take? Chair Bressy, I believe that uh, if we were to take action starting today in terms of drafting the bylaw and advertising it and whatnot, probably the earliest that we could get to uh, council would be sometime in early July, Great. early mid-July. Thank you. Um, any other questions on this matter? I think it'd be great. Would somebody be willing to make a motion even if it's just to receive for information? Uh, Councillor Clayton. Thanks, uh, Chair Bressier. Uh, I would move that we receive this report for information. Great. Th thank you. And yeah, I'll, I'll be supporting that. It's I know I was the guy that brought this forward, and I think that I might have pushed for something different if there was an easy way to do it with a resolution. But I think if it's going to take the time that we're getting to midsummer anyways, I think this is of limited help to a lot of these businesses. And I don't think it's I don't want to see us investing a lot of council and administration time into this, so I'll be supporting this motion as much as I wish that we had more tools available to us. Any discussion or debate? In that case, all in favor? And that motion carries. Great, thank you. And then I think that it's still your show, Joe, and we've got a verbal report on rural industrial zoning. Thank you, Chair Bressy. At the recent public hearing for the land use bylaw amendment, C-1260-120, there was some discussion amongst council as to whether or not we had any existing land zoned IR, the Rural Industrial Land Use District. Um, there are no other lands that are currently zoned IR. 
Uh, the district was adopted in May of 2014. Uh, it was the result of the direction from the Community Growth Committee to create an industrial district that allowed for a rural road cross section. Uh, as part of its implementation, there were no parcels rezoned uh, in, in, uh, at the same time as the adoption and we have not received any uh, applications since then. So this is the first. Okay. That's um, all I have on this matter. Great, thank you. I know a conversation that was a council that I that I had concerns about. I don't know if I'm the only one that has these concerns, but others are worried about it too. But my big worry is as we're getting these about how they'll interface with urban with urban rural roads, where I've got no I've got no issues with rural with these rural cross sections, but I'm worried. But personally, I I still don't understand how it'll work if we've got a section right next to it that's not rural industrial and all of a sudden it's got a different road cross section we're trying to we're trying to connect and maybe there's a worry there maybe there's not a worry there i just honestly don't understand how it's supposed to work and i'm not sure if there's others that have the same confusion same worry if we want to have if there's others that are interested in having more conversation about what that looks like or if it's just a bee that's kind of in my bonnet Sure, uh, Chair Bressy, I can take a stab at that, and certainly the um, the engineering department may have additional comments. I could I could follow up with them. Um, first off, I, I believe that when we're looking at applying this land use district, we are taking in its uh, the parcels context uh, into consideration. And so, if it were say immediately adjacent to an area that's currently underdeveloped to an urban standard, we'd have to pay a lot more attention to it uh, to see how it was going to integrate. Uh, in this particular instance, it's, it's uh, considerably far out in the rural service area. And we're having discussions about how that area uh, will shape out. And it's entirely possible that that area may have a rural industrial feel forever. Um, so, so in that, in that particular situation, I see it as, as low risk in that regard. Um, another consideration is that if there is an area that is to a rural standard, it's likely going to be separated from areas of an urban standard by arterial roadways or different land uses. And we'll have the opportunity to provide the transition in a, in a, uh, reasonable way. Um, I know that in doing the uh, rural cross sections and everything, all of the engineering considerations um, or all of the in engineering issues are considered. They're just handled differently. And I, I'm confident that there is uh, ways to integrate them. I'm not entirely familiar with how it's done, but um, I, it's my understanding that it's achievable. Um, I guess one last question I've got is, do you have to know if, um, I know that the cross section we're asking a lot less in terms of infrastructure being developed there, but in terms of, I'm trying to think 75, 100 years out from now, uh, if I get that it's going to be rural for a long, long, long time, but it might not always be the case. And in terms of the, in terms of the right of way that gets, that gets taken for roads in the section, is there space to add urban cross section in the future if we need to? Thank you, Chair Bressy. My understanding is that the, the uh, rural cross-section is uh, considerably bigger than the urban cross-section. Um, so I believe the answer would be yes, but I would have to follow up with engineering to be sure on that one. And then, uh, Director Glavin, are you hoping to get in? Yeah, thanks, Chair Bressy. Yeah, with the, regarding the cross-section, the rural cross-sections are wider. So when it comes time for an urban cross-section to be implemented, there would be sufficient uh, road right way to do so. This wouldn't be that, dis you know, there's other examples of interface between urban and rural in the city already to some degree. Like, you know, you look at Park Road even is one that's a rural cross-section right now that we're going to upgrade to an urban uh, this year. Um, Brochu Industrial Park on the west side, which was annexed from the county. We haven't done upgrades to an urban cross section in there, but you can kind of see how they um, interact with Westgate West uh, in that area where seven generations is put in their building, where you do see a connection between the two. So it's it's not foreign to us, but uh, you know the rural industrial is is a new 
uh, classification for us. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Definitely puts a lot of my thinking at ease. So thank you. I appreciate that. Is there any other questions from committee or somebody willing to make a motion, even if it's just to accept for information? Councillor Clayton. Thanks, uh, Councillor Bressy. I think you uh, nailed it. That this seems to be a bee in your bonnet. As, uh, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of uh, discussion or comment. Uh, regardless, I'd, I'd be prepared to make a motion to receive this report for information. Great. Um, and any, any debate on that motion? Great, not seeing any, all in favor? And motion carries. And that moves us to our outstanding items list, Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, so we have three items that were presented today that can come off. We have 1092, the Rural Industrial Zoning, 1063, uh, the Cannabis uh, Information, as well as 1087, Home-Based Business Signs. And everything else on there is on track. Uh, 1086 for secondary suites is still waiting for a date, but we do have our workshop scheduled for tomorrow. So we'll see what falls out of the workshop and uh, we should have a date here soon. Great, thank you. And can I get a motion to accept that? Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thanks Chair Bressy, so moved as amended. Awesome, and all in favor? And that motion carries. And with that, we'll adjourn the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee meeting. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I will call to order the community services meeting uh, for today, and we'll begin with the director's area of service area update. Uh, director Miller. Yeah. Thank you, Chair uh, Friesen. So I'll start off with the uh, Community Knowledge Campus. So, uh, and Director Glavin already mentioned this, but I just wanted to add a little bit more with uh, with the robot, uh, Artie. So uh, it was the initial. Uh, I guess a voyage is the way we want to maybe call it, but uh, it was 10 acres that uh, was mowed and it took between five and six hours. And uh, the staff down there were really impressed with how straight the lines were and uh, just how well the GPS worked. So uh, I wanted to mention that. And then also with the restrictions uh, due to COVID-19, Alberta wired wildfire in Grand Prairie, they were unable to complete the required training, which they usually do within their own facility. So we were able to accommodate them down at uh, CKC at the synthetic field. And uh, so they were able to meet the requirements for our wildfire season. So that's another good news story. And then just a little bit more on phase two of GP grows. Uh, Brian mentioned that as well, but uh, we had about 12 CKC staff that uh, were involved in the last session of it and uh, shoveling dirt, making up the packages, doing traffic control and distrib distribution of the packages as well. And uh, they really enjoyed it, and uh, they think it's a great thing for the community. And it, uh, it was also a great teamwork with our staff. So just wanted to mention that. And then switching to events and entertainment, uh, Montrose Cultural Center is on track to open up June 2nd, and that's in line with uh, the Art Gallery and Jeffries also will be open on June 2nd. And uh, the hours of operation are going to be Tuesday to Sunday for Phase One, and that's uh, it'll. MCC will be open the same hours as uh, the Art Gallery. And then Revolution Place is partnering with uh, the Art Gallery as well to bring in what they call the Curve. Uh, this exhibit uh, will showcase all genres of uh, art, visual, music, and written with a local response to the COVID-19 crisis. Submissions uh, begin on June 2nd and uh, the exhibit opens on June 9th. And then switching to facilities, uh, right now, they're busy working with our agent, our health and safety consultant, and also procurement, just on all the requirements for reopening our facilities. And there's lots of little things that we have to do to be in compliance with uh, the AHS uh, guidelines. And then they just recently had the startup meeting for the museum storage uh, project. And then uh, also working with uh, sports development, wellness, and culture to uh, review the HDC project uh, working with the archives to uh, hopefully transition them into that space. And then on the school board building, the demolition, uh, the tender has been awarded and uh, I believe the plan is for sure by September, the building will be taken down. But in talking to Mr. Phillips, he anticipates it'll actually happen sooner than that. I think uh, prior to that, there still is a plan to remove some of uh, the equipment in the building and to repurpose some of that. So. And switching to fleet, uh, right now we have three sweepers that are operational and available to transportation staff. We 
the one that is down and uh, we've had a bit of a consistent problem with uh, two of our newer models where uh, just the location of the wiring on the units and uh, with the debris that gets uh, I guess uh, brought up from the road uh, it's uh, damaging the wiring so we're uh, trying to rectify that. And then uh, just another note here that uh, all the, the road repair equipment and the mowing equipment uh, is operating well and uh, most of it's in use right now. And then with sports development, wellness and culture, uh, we're anticipating by uh, June, June 1st that summer camp registration will be open. And then our outdoor recreational facilities and the dog parks are now open in accordance with uh, the provincial restrictions. Uh, at this time, league play is not allowed and that's also uh, in accordance with the provincial uh, guidelines. Switching to transit, uh, ridership remains at about 30% uh, pre-COVID levels. So on an average weekday right now, we have about 580 riders, and previously it was about 1,800 riders. And uh, Mr. Harvard's also uh, implemented a, a series of automatic voice announcements on the buses. So as it nears a, a major transfer point, there is some messaging that comes across, and right now it's COVID related, just reminders to uh, the riders to uh, the physical distancing and take other precautions as well. So, and I think that's it, uh, Madam Chair, unless there's any questions for me. Thanks, Arlen. Any questions for Director Miller? I think uh, Councillor Clayton has one. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. thank yep. you. Go ahead. Thank quick. you. Um, thanks, uh, Director Miller. Just uh, one I know you didn't mention, and one you may have missed. I may have missed, but uh, can you give me a facilities update on uh, the library and the museum? Uh, Sorry, in oh, regards uh, to openings, if we opening dates, um, yeah. where they fit into what phase, etc. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. So. Uh, with uh, the museum is slated for June 2nd as well. And then uh, we're just in the process of recalling staff for that to happen. And with the library, I don't know that uh, the date has been determined on that one yet. I think uh, that one, we have to uh, work with uh, Deborah or Deb Kreiderman. And last time I checked, she hadn't uh, clearly articulated a date to reopen, but if we can just hang on half a sec, I might have uh, more information. Library? Okay, so it and it is in phase two. Okay. So I think I uh, I heard on the radio this morning that the government's still planning on phase two for June nineteenth, if uh, COVID stays in the current state. So, so if, probably. If, if I may, uh, Chair Friesen, I just had one other question. Um, Director Miller, maybe for you or for um, Protective Services, but I'm curious if there's any discussion in regards to outdoor pools. Um, in, in, and, and I understand the opening for a recreation facility, facilities such as pools was pushed to uh, possibly the fall. Um, I just wonder if there's any discussion in outdoor pools. To me, you know, it's easier to manage a certain number of people in a, in a change room at, at our outdoor pool. Um, it uh, would be easy to manage less than 50 people. There's obviously chlorine um, and other factors that I, I would think that uh, can make it, you know, a fairly safe facility. And so I just wonder, um, it's just, I mean, for obvious reasons, it's, we had it for a few weeks last year. Um, it uh, would serve its perfect purpose very well in regards to repriving people from the sun this summer. And so I just wondered if there's any opportunity for discussion with AHS. And cause it, it is a unique facility in itself. So I just, if you could give me an, any information you might have on that. George Miller. Uh, Thanks, Chair Friesen. So the, the most recent information on the outdoor pool is we are doing the prep work right now to, uh, to have it ready for use as soon as possible. So we're anticipating uh, perhaps by mid-July, we might, uh, AHS might say we can have it open. It's about a three to four week process to uh, actually prep it, to uh, dewinterize and fill it and heat it and then uh, treat the water. Right now, AHS is not uh, allowing uh, testing of the water samples. so. So as soon as that's allowed to happen, we're hope, or allowed to occur, we're hoping to have our samples ready to, uh, to ship off. And then uh, we also have Angela Redding and uh, her crew, they're in touch with, uh, it's a provincial network of uh, pool operators. 
and just trying to get a gauge from the province through that network as well as to when they may be open. But we are anticipating, hopefully by mid-July, the pool should be up and running. So. That's great. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Any further questions for Director Miller? And I'm not seeing any unless I've missed. Um, sorry. All right. We'll go on then. Uh, we have Mr. Phillips to uh, give us an update on, we'd ask for some information about doing some special lighting. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Friesen. Uh, so yeah, the recommendation this morning is that uh, Community uh, Services Committee, uh, you had directed us to uh, further investigate and if feasible, um, proceed with a partnership opportunity with Center 2000 uh, for the installation uh, of a special lighting project. Um, and so I know the recommendation was that we would, uh, or the request is, is that we would provide uh, options for special lighting at different facilities or locations. Uh, and so as mentioned, the, the recommendation this morning is gonna be that we would uh, explore what a partnership opportunity would look like uh, for Center 2000 uh, and the lighting of the sundial landmark. Um, and so I'll provide a little bit of information. I can go uh, just a, a quick summary of the report. Uh, and as everybody's aware, um, municipalities, uh, corporate organizations around the world, um, many of them uh, are installing high visibility lighting systems uh, uh, on different facilities, bridges, landmarks, all with the intention of promoting or showing support, uh, bringing awareness to different uh, um, local events, international initiatives, um, uh, all different kinds of venues are being uh, brought to light uh, by uh, specific lighting uh, programs. And so when we looked at this, um, it was actually quite interesting, all the different opportunities that, that were available. Um, but uh, the, the farther that we dug into it, the more we realized that it's a, it's a, a very specialized um, type of lighting that's required for facility illumination. Um, and they provide lighting to, to highlight a certain feature, a landmark or, or a facility, rather than just lighting the facility itself. Uh, Revolution Place is a, is a good example which as you can see in some of the, uh, the images that I included, that the lighting on the facilities, uh, they're, they're designed to, to provide lighting generally for the pathway uh, uh, walkways of the facility and minor illumination of the facility, but not to illuminate the facility or, or highlight the facility in any way. Um, so that, that was definitely uh, taken into account when we started looking at what options we had. Um, so, to change many of those fixtures uh, would require either fixture upgrades or, or lighting relocations uh, in, in many of the options that we looked at. Um, in, as far as the, uh, the impact uh, in, in relationship to uh, city council focus areas, uh, infrastructure and community are definitely the two that would be highlighted. Um, social impact, uh, architectural illumination can definitely bring awareness uh, and it's something that people are, are with social media now uh, all it takes is a, a couple of posts to get out there in social media of something that's lit up somewhere or highlighted uh, and, it, and it travels fast and then people want to go see it for themselves. Um, so, so the social side is, is definitely a factor. Um, on the risk side, uh, there is very minimal risk regarding this project, uh, very minimal, with the exception that if we were to change uh, fixtures or lighting on certain facilities, we would have to make sure that they still meet code uh, and, and provide those code requirements that are required by the uh, Alberta Building Code. Um, alternatives uh, that, we, you know, that we would present at this time would be that we could reevaluate the option uh, for illumination of uh, the city entrance features. Um, we could also, and we have explored a little bit uh, of looking at permitting facility managers uh, of certain facilities uh, to use their operational staff to illuminate uh, more of a decorative fashion rather than illuminate the building. Uh, and so that would, that would require a little more exploring, uh, but it is an option we can certainly look at. Uh, and then also that uh, the committee could just receive this report for information. Um, from a stakeholder engagement perspective, um, we did speak to a number of uh, service providers, uh, vendors of different products, so a lot of research that we obviously did um, uh, online, just with the vendors that we've dealt with in the past. Um, uh, it did come up in conversation, though, uh, with uh, Center 2000, uh, as, I, as I also sit on the board uh, with the Center 2000 board, uh, that they have had requests, uh, numerous requests in the past for lighting up the sundial. 
uh, something that uh, we hadn't even thought of. We we thought of it as an option, but never had uh, had it occurred to us that that people were actually requesting from the the Centre 2000 group uh, that those requests were being made, and in fact they had been. Um, so that was the the reasoning for uh, bringing forward the recommendation. Um, I did include some numbers uh, as far as just what it costs to put uh, LED lighting or specialized lighting in certain venues. Um, I did include the cost of the, the LED strip lighting that uh, Center 2000 uh, did on their building back in 2017. So there, those costs are included, uh, you know, $10,000 just to do an LED strip lighting around the perimeter uh, or, or uh, fascia um, areas of the building. Uh, Center 2000 as well. We redid the exterior lighting itself actually in 2018. Uh, the fixtures themselves uh, were outdated and, and even though it, it's not that old of a building, the fixtures themselves uh, were starting to fail. And so we changed those to LED just in, in the one, it needed to be done and, and two, moving to a, a more high efficient product uh, as, as many people are doing these days. And we're doing a lot of in different initiatives uh, within the city uh, in that regard. Uh, one of the ones that really caught our attention, though, was that um, uh, Lethbridge City Hall. So we're in contact with a number of different Alberta municipalities as far as a, a corporate management group and, and what we've done at different facilities and, and what they're doing. And so it was uh, it was very evident that that project, uh, as you can see from the image that I've included in the report, doesn't seem like a lot of spectacular lighting, uh, but it is a very well done project, looks very good, but at a cost of $80,000 to make sure that they got the right lighting effects uh, and the opportunity to put whatever color scheme that they would like to, depending on the season or depending on the group that they would be promoting. Um, so the, uh, the the potential for a lower project cost was became very evident to us. The Center 2000 uh, and the Sundial would be something that we would certainly support and, and would recommend to uh, committee to consider uh, with a partnership opportunity with Center 2000 uh, and the Sundial. And so um, if there's any questions, I'm certainly open to, uh, to answer those questions as far as this project goes. Thanks, Mr. Phillips. Um, I see that Councillor Clayton has a question. Go ahead, Councillor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Friesen. Uh, uh, Mr. Phillips, uh, I, I, personally, I quite like this, uh, this opportunity recommendation. Um, I also wonder, though, in your sort of exploratory research, um, was there any consideration given for um, the facility, the Revolution Place facility, and um, and and not uh, per se as shown as the City of Lethbridge, where it's the whole front facade something, but uh, I know sort of around the the coffee shop there was discussion that the windows on the north side of the facility, uh, adjacent across the street to say Better Than Fred's, are, are quite a feature of that facility, and. Uh, whether it's in, uh, exterior lighting, uh, up lighting on those great window features or interior, um, that, that also could be an opportunity. And I, so I'm just curious if there was any uh, consideration for that facility. Uh, through the chair, uh, absolutely, uh, Councillor Clayton. Uh, I, that was actually my, my personal first choice, to be honest. <laughs> and I, I heard that coffee shop talk. Um, we did explore it. Uh, I, I think that it would be something that we should pursue in the future, but at this time it would be cost prohibitive. Um, the structure uh, is very conducive to lighting, but the lighting itself uh, would have to be very specific to that site. And so we'd be looking at, at one fixture um, per glass block wall. Uh, and those fixtures can range, depending on what we would need, are around five to $15,000 per fixture. Uh, plus the controller. Um, so we did explore that, um, but felt at this time that it would be cost prohibitive, but I would like to keep it uh, for the record uh, that we would pursue that in the future, absolutely. If Can I just have a follow-up, uh, Chair Friesen? Yep, go ahead. Um, thanks for that information. Uh, I, and also, in the um, research, it seems that there's uh, quite a few, you know, the technology with lighting changes all the time and rather quickly. Um, as you can tell, in most people's houses, some people have warm lighting and they would go to replace it. It's not available. So you have some cool light bulbs, some warm light bulbs. Lighting changes uh, continually. And and so I'm curious on the technology of the LED. Um, I see some commercial facilities around the community and now in uh, residential homes, uh, there's quite a, um opportunity with strip lighting that's 
uh, computer controlled and and from my understanding it's not as expensive as it used to be um so i'm just curious if you've done any um sort of digging or uh, have any information on that uh, sort of pricing as of yet uh, through the chair, uh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that we looked at was actually the the potential of uh, strip lighting uh, for the sundial uh, in itself. Um, and while the the technology is advancing very rapidly, the the cost uh, is quite low on a lot of the residential and non-commercial products. Uh, the commercial product itself is is still relatively high in price. Um, but also the technology, uh, as you mentioned, is advancing very rapidly. The, the cost comes in the, uh, in the controllers for the systems and the availability of them to be able to have that RGB spectrum where any color under the rainbow can be selected, but then also the, the ability to have a, a cast of light. So how wide do you want that light to spread? And then how far do you want the light to be thrown? Those were the two things that really factor in between the residential and the commercial side of things. We also did find that there's a number of products um, that we would that we would have liked to have explored, um, but as far as a certification goes for available to be used commercially in Canada, that's one of the um, drawbacks that we weren't able to get past is that there are products available, but they need to be certified for commercial use uh, in Alberta or in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just jump in with a question. I don't see anyone else with a hand up just now. Um, I seem to recall that when we spoke about this, the idea came out of um, when we were doing the city entrance feature, and there was a little money left over. Um, what was that amount? Did do you know, Mr. Phillips? Uh, sure, reason I I believe it was about twenty five thousand. I, I would have to double check though. Uh, please don't quote me on that, but I believe it was around twenty five thousand. Uh, okay. Okay, and uh, so the quote or the the estimate that you have here of that twenty to twenty five does that give us the full RGB um, uh, yes, it does. flexibility and and the throw of the light? Uh, Chair Friesen, yeah, yes, it does. That 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 is a, a lighting system that, in talking with uh, one of our service providers, that uh, there are six lights currently right now that illuminate the the sundial. Um, so it would either be six. Uh, or potentially even four lights um, with the availability for them to be able to throw that light as long as it needs to be to get to the top of the sundial uh, and then also aimed properly. Uh, and that also includes then the controller that would be utilized uh, to be able to put a timing schedule uh, as, as much as we would like to schedule that uh, as far as our sunrise and sunset and then as well as whatever colors we would like to choose. All right, thank you. Uh, any Further questions? Oh, Director Miller, I see you have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair Friesen. Uh, just to clarify, I think it is about 25000 that was left over, but the intent for that money that's left over is uh, for the Downtown Association. Once we finish the production and installation, whatever funds are left, I think committee did agree that uh, the Downtown would have access to them. Our plan with this project is a partnership with Centre 2000, and uh, Mr. Burke's on the line as well, and uh, he... He may have some comments about uh, the partnership and uh, how they can actually fund it. So this should be a, a no-cost project is what we're hoping for the city. Oh, okay, because that is kind of what I'm getting at. Uh, Mr. Borg? Uh, thank you, Chair Friesen. Uh, I'm the chair of the Centre 2000 board. That's why uh, Director Miller has asked me to comment here. We have had a preliminary discussion about um, whether this is a, something we'd be interested in, and uh, the board uh, thought it was a good idea. Um, we needed much. Uh, we needed some more information about costs and the technology and, and the operations of it. Um, but uh, the Centre 2000 does have uh, some reserves, and as we're approaching the 20th anniversary of that facility, we have been looking for some opportunities to ensure that that facility remains relevant. Um, and we were looking at some uh, technology for the conference rooms and some ideas like that. So while I can't say that we uh, would be in agreement, um, I wouldn't uh, want to uh, prejudice the board's uh, ruling on that. They were open to receiving this as an idea and to further the discussion, um, and uh, we can uh, report back once uh, we've pursued those details. But it would be utilizing uh, Centre 2000 reserves uh, for this project was what uh, Mr. Phillips is recommending. Oh, okay, thank you very much. That does clarify. So any other questions? If not, um, I'll look for a motion if there's any arising. Uh, Councillor Platt? Uh, thanks, 
Chair Friesen, I'll just make a motion that the, that on the recommendation that the community services committee direct administration further investigate the, the feasibility to proceed with partnership with Center Center 2000 for the installation of the special ed unit at Terminal Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so there is a motion to proceed. Any, any, uh, with the invested, of the looking at a partnership. Um, all in favor? Great, that motion passes, thank you. And that takes us back to uh, Director Miller for a report on the outstanding items list. Okay, thanks Chair Friesen. Uh, so the first item on the list, 1084, uh, we have a September 1st reporting date, but we're anticipating we should be able to bring that forward sooner for the archives uh, update with HDC. And I think uh, with 1076 special lighting, we should be able to remove that today. If, uh, if we're not able to work out the partnership, then we'll bring back additional information to uh, committee, but I'm anticipating we should be successful on that. Thank you. And then uh, 1070 and 71 with the community group funding, we're on track for uh, June 24th to report back on that. And uh, Revolution Place enhancements, I think uh, we're a little bit aggressive on the date here, but we're uh, in talking to Catherine and uh, facilities anticipating we can bring that back uh, June 9th, so two weeks from today. And, uh, and the, that is the more comprehensive uh, vision for a rev place. So, uh, unless there's any questions, Chair Friesen? Uh, I see that Councilor Palat has one. Thanks, Chair Friesen. Uh, just a question for Director Miller regarding the Revolution Place. Um, I know I spoke with Catherine a while back, and just, I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering what administration's takes on how we're gonna look at doing that, because we still don't have if I, unless I'm misunderstanding, we probably won't have concrete numbers by then. So it's just more of a hope of a pulse check of council on a number to go away with. I'm just trying to understand what that, that's going to look like on Japan so we can best support uh, this moving forward as in Catherine. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. So when talking to Catherine, she's anticipating we should have some numbers early next week. And uh, so I've... I think with the uh, support of CLT, it'll be a late report uh, that'll be approved by CLT. But uh, we really want to bring this forward to uh, to council or to committee. With uh, hopefully we can decide on uh, one of the options and then move forward with it in 2020 to uh, to help the local business communities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Miller? Great. Then uh, can I get a motion to receive Councilor Black? Thanks, Chair Friesen. I just make a motion to receive the uh, outstanding item list as a minute. Great. And all in favor? That passes. Thank you. All right. And with that, I will close the Community Services Committee agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is my turn, I guess. Good morning to everybody. And let's start at the Cooperative Service Committee meeting agenda today. And uh, for the report, 101, 1.1 1 .1 director, verbal report, Shane Brooke. Chair Meinhoff, can I interrupt for a minute? We have a delegation that was added, so we need to add that to the agenda. The Highland Park Neighborhood Association. Oh, we have a delegation, okay. Let's uh, add it into the agenda. That will and be- And they're on the line. When we got added 1.4? No, one we'll add it first before the report. Oh, first, okay. And who are they? Thank you. Okay, we have a delegation report first. Could you come out, delegation? Is this asking me to, to yeah. comment? Okay, <laughs> sorry, I didn't understand that. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Councillor Yad Minhas. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is regarding the delegation that we had sent last week. Um, if you guys had had a chance to look over that. Um, we, we had realized that there was a, a meeting on April the 14th um, regarding bylaw C1422. So that's for the establishment of boards and committees. 
and uh, we just wanted to express that we were concerned that uh, neighborhood associations, we, we did not notice that neighborhood associations were included anywhere, um, and that our concern was that we just, we just want to make sure that we're um, council is, is still aware that we're out here and that some of us are very active and um, we don't want to be forgotten. Okay. That's it. Hello. Um, sorry. Uh, well, the, the rest of it in the in the letter, um, I can. I'll just go over it then. Um, so we just the our, we have a couple points, main points, kind of out of the letter. So we just wanted to. We were hoping to see a more clear expectation of our role from the city. Um, so uh, we just wanted like a clarification on on the city's vision for neighborhood associations. Uh, just so we, we know what we're doing, we know what we're expected to do from the city. Um, so without without this clear vision or communication, sometimes we're trying to work with city administration and uh, I guess there's just some frustration there because it's all volunteer based. Um, and we want to do things as clearly and concisely and, and as efficiently as possible. And we feel like we're not doing that. Um, and this, this is just uh, going to impact overall sustainability for neighborhood associations. I'm not sure how, um, how uh, maybe active everyone else's neighborhood association is in their own area, but ours happens to be fairly active. Um, and and we, we finally, to wrap that up, we believe that neighborhood associations can, can you know, have a, an important advisory role maybe to the to council and we wanted to be included with the nonprofit um, committee okay. any question for Casey from the council so this is this is Dylan I'd love to if I may chair yes go ahead um, Casey, I'm just kind of curious. You guys have had probably the most active neighborhood association in the city. My apologies now that I'm off the mute. Um, uh, got new security cameras that are ringing up, so my apologies for that. Um, anyways, my my question is, you guys have a very active neighborhood association and probably the most active one in the city, and I know you guys are also very connected with a lot of other neighborhood associations. I was kind of curious, it's, it's great to hear from you guys, just how are things going with your neighborhood association and the ones that you guys are connected with? Things, th thank you, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Bressy for asking. Um, things have been really good with our neighborhood association. However, we, we are all experiencing uh, volunteer burnout, of course, um, just because we all have active lives, we all work uh, full time. Most of us work full time, and we have commitments on our time, and uh, we just try to to do the best that we can. Um, I, I feel like uh, for our neighborhood association, it's it's we try to keep things very positive. Um, our our neighborhood association page is of course public, so anybody is welcome to like it and follow anything that we do. Um, f for other neighborhood associations, though, we do find that they struggle. Um, as do we, um, but more so with other ones with with engagement, like engaging the public, and and um, we want to be seen as a, something relevant to the public. We we try to post updates from the city, and when we see it, we see them on their Facebook page because the major majority of um, our residents in our area have Facebook, so that is the the medium that we use to uh, get news out. So, you know, if we had more. Um, news or anything that was posted from the city if we could find out about it right away that's something we can get out to residents we have a lot of followers and they turn to us when uh, they hear news or they see something and they're like okay well we want more clarification and they message us so we would like to be in on that uh, any news that you have out there anything that you like to express to the public we want to be able to um, to be able to answer those messages right away because uh, residents believe that they don't have direct access to council or to uh, the, uh, you know the powers that be so they reach out to us because they know that we're kind of the in between and we like we like that we like to be the in between all right thank you any other question uh, Dylan 
If it's not, I got one question. How you guys communicate and make a volunteer more um, kind of positive and uh, attractive to do the work for community? And you have the group, you guys communicate better on, or just the Facebook you use? With the public, we mostly use Facebook or um, we also have Instagram. So social media we have found is has been um, the greatest benefit for getting news out there. Uh, we, of course, we do have a community events board. So um, people who are not on Facebook or they're, they're, but you have to be walking kind of in order to see anything posted on that community events board. Um, that's by Lions Park. I'm not sure if anybody is aware uh, that there is a board there for public posting. Um, we also have, I'm not sure if anybody has used this yet, but it's called the next door. Um, so that's a, um, um, something online. You, there's also an app for it. So you can have it on your phone. Um, and, and we found that's really useful for people who are not on Facebook, but they're still, they still have internet access and they're still doing things online, uh, but they don't necessarily have, uh, Facebook. So that's been really good as well, getting the word out there. We have our, um, other members of our association who post our public notices to the next door app okay thank you very much is there any other question to casey if it's not so we'll deal with this and see uh mr hey chair uh, arlen miller wants in on the queue just uh oh, okay. sorry ed yeah oh. okay thanks thank uh, thanks chair minhas uh, i just wanted to add that uh when we received the letter, uh, we had uh, Katie Bieberdorf reach out to uh, and uh, make contact with Casey. So our, uh, or uh, she might have actually called uh, Rebecca Keys, but um, Patricia Millward, who is our primary point of contact with the neighborhood associations has been off for a period of time with uh, COVID and uh, some other uh, issues as well. So there's, we've probably been a little bit remiss in our uh, communication with the neighborhood associations, but we do have a plan to uh, address that right away. So I just wanted to make committee aware of that. No, oh, thank you, Arun Miller. So I've got to see the queue. Anybody else on the queue asking questions for Casey? If it's not, then we'll deal with this after. Casey, thank you very much for your letter and information updating to us. Okay, then we move into 101 directors. Sorry, sorry, Chair, may I ask a question? Yes, please. I'm just kind of curious. I'm not on committee, so I can't even try to make any motions, but if, um, but if committee did want to do something with this, would it make sense to have conversation now at the end of the meeting or as part of the boards and committee conversation where I am motivated, I would like us to have more conversation about neighborhood associations. I was curious where oh, that oh, conversation yeah. should happen. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought was we going to do it after the delegation part, or we want to do anybody from the committee can say anything, uh, Kevin or Eunice. Kevin? Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, the, the, the Neighborhood Association uh, reaching out to us. Uh, I think the Neighborhood Associations are a very important part of our community. And uh, I will be addressing this at the end of the, the meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, and if I may, sir, uh, Chairman Hess, I, um, I was thinking we may have some discussion about it as we do the, the uh, boards and committees uh, review coming up. So I think it'll come up again. And, and thank you very much to Highland Park for uh, being represented here today. Okay. Thank you, Eunice. So we'll discuss it after we finish our agenda and then bring the motion on this one. Thank you very much. And uh, any other question? If it's not, then uh, I'd like to ask Shane Brook to be verbal update for. Uh, thank you, Chairman Haas. Uh, assessment and taxation have uh, um, done the paperwork to uh, to levy the, uh, the tax for the year. Uh, notices are planned to go out uh, next week. We're just uh, updating uh, some brochure documents are going to be in inserted inside the envelopes to ensure that uh, residents know about the, um, the option to uh, um, uh, register before August 31st to uh, make a pay payment plan between then and the end of December. So we're just updating some of that information so it'll be in everyone's household when they, when they get their tax notice. Um, with finance, we have uh, not yet accessed our line of credit. I committed to keep you updated uh, on where we are with that. 
that is this much, just the timing of when we receive uh, some of our large payment uh, invoices. The next one we expect is the uh, um, quarterly payment for the RCMP. Uh, we received it, it's due in July, so it's now just a matter of uh, some cash management. With tax notices going out next week, we are still hopeful that the residents that are able to pay will, will pay so that we can uh, um, not access that as quickly. Uh, also from finance, uh, we're scheduled on June 9th uh, for there to be a presentation on the budget timeline so that there's some expectations of what council will, will receive, including the engagement plans from now through uh, budget passing in, uh, in November. Uh, we also will uh, be bringing on June 23rd a report from Danielle, our Chief Financial Officer on Reserves. Uh, that'll be a chance for you to, uh, to get an update on that and have a discussion about uh, what the appropriate level is and what a plan is going forward to, uh, to, to utilize those or to build them up. And so that's scheduled for June 23rd. Uh, procurement uh, have been uh, meeting with all departments following the capital mid-year mid capital uh, review last week to come up with a plan so that we can ensure that those projects uh, get started on a timely basis and we can uh, put uh, Grand Prairie residents back to work as soon as possible. So we are monitoring that very closely to ensure that that work, uh, work happens in a timely fashion. Uh, and we're also, they're also working on acquiring the ne necessary personal protective equipment uh, to ensure a safe uh, reopening when, uh, when that happens for the city. Uh, from our corporate efficiency group, uh, just the, an update on the Canola to Key, that the two, uh, two main components that are being focused on right now are lot grading, uh, which is uh, nearing 80% uh, complete, and the uh, building inspection review, which is about 60% uh, complete. So that project is uh, it's continuing to advance. Uh, one final thing I wanted to raise was uh, we're planning on uh, June 9th to come to committee with uh, the follow-up uh, to the uh, AUMA uh, resolution discussion. Um, there is uh, one proposed resolution from administration dealing with uh, 911 fire uh, fees that uh, is being proposed. Um, but I wanted to also just follow up on uh, the uh, um, uh, request for decision that uh, Councillor Bressey had brought forward. Um, we had talked about whether that should go to a fall uh, AUMA resolution. We've had a discussion with AUMA and they've proposed an alternative option for us. They're looking at having a virtual uh, meeting in mid-June uh, to talk about the Local Authorities Election Act. They have uh, offered us the opportunity to bring forward uh, our uh, request for decision at that meeting. All members of AUMA would be able to vote on it. Uh, the advantage of this is that uh, it would happen sooner. Uh, we could raise some attention as a standalone item as opposed to combined with the other 20 or so resolutions in the fall. And uh, they're just looking for some uh, uh, a sense of whether we would be supportive of this. Um, I don't need a formal motion, just uh, if there's some willingness to continue down this path uh, to proceed with this in June, we would do that. And uh, that would be my recommendation is uh, just to let this process unfold here in June. And uh, uh, this would be a good advocacy initiative for here in the spring. And that's all I have to update here for my report today. Sorry, mute Councillor Minhas. Yeah, you got to take your microphone and turn it on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, anybody have a question on it, Kevin? You're gonna. Yeah, uh, I'll make a motion to uh, to make the motion that uh, Mr. Burke has suggested for June 9. Yes. All right, just, just, to, just to clarify, um, I don't need a motion uh, to proceed with the RFD this spring. We already have council endorsement of that. This is just AUMA moving into a different process. So if there was no objection to it, um, administration can just proceed with, with that action. Oh, that works fine. for me. That works for us. So any other question for Shane? Anybody? Uh, Chris, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chad. Uh, Shane, just a question. Uh, what's the deadline for resolutions to be submitted into AUMA? Uh, it's not at the top of my head right now, and I don't have it in front of me. Sure. They've just recently, or sorry, Council, uh, Chair Minhas, they've uh, they've just recently uh, extended that to June 30th um, for resolutions to be submitted. There is an opportunity for an extension for seconders uh, to be uh, to be added. There's a new process this year where this has to be a formal resolution from seconding councils. Uh, to uh, to support them, but there is some flexibility there. Uh, so we 
do have opportunity uh, to still submit one here uh, before the end of June. Beautiful. Thanks, uh, Shane. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else in the queue? If it's not, no, it doesn't seem like. Thank you very much for Shane for the information, updating. Now we move to the bylaw C1422 draft implement board and community committee early. You're in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, committee. Last year, Council directed administration to implement changes to modernize the city's approach to establishing and governing boards and committees as outlined in the boards and committees framework. Currently, the city uses isolated ad hoc processes that result in the implementation of separate but similar governance documents. Identical provisions have been identified and now currently make up the general pro provisions that are contained within this proposed bylaw. At the April 14th committee meeting, uh, administration did present the draft uh, bylaw that you see before you and uh, provided additional feedback uh, that um, in support of that feedback, we've now um, presented you a new draft bylaw. Some of the changes that we incorporated are listed in the report. Um, and so I'm sure you're aware of what we've changed within the proposed bylaw. I just want to comment on uh, one of the proposed changes was to uh, lengthen the council term from one year. And I just want to um, provide some additional information on what our current practice is, um, which is in support of the procedure bylaw section 3.2 subsection C, which allows our council to review and appoint council members at the organizational meeting of council on an annual basis. And so if it is, um, it gives council that opportunity every year to just review the current appointments of our council members and realign if necessary. Uh, it, with respect to the information presented by the delegation, uh, I know I, I've been in contact with administration, how we can further support neighborhood associations. And because neighborhood associations are registered societies, they are independent external bodies. So we as a city can't incorporate them into our bylaw, but what we could do as a city and what council could could consider is including a representative of the neighborhood associations as a public member appointment. And I feel that the community advisory committee would be a good fit for um, engaging our neighborhood associations in a formal committee of, of the city. Um, so just something for you to consider as we have this discussion. And with that, um, I am open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlene. And uh, any questions for Arlene or the support? And uh, Kevin, too? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. carver I, I do think that the recommendation that you had made is good for the neighborhood associations. And uh, you know, I, I would totally be supportive of that. Like I said earlier, the neighborhood associations have been great for the development of our community and uh, creating partnerships amongst uh, fellow residents throughout the city. And uh, I would be in favor to support them in some manner, and that would be one manner that I would definitely support. So thank you. Is there anybody else? Wade, and then Dylan, and Clyde. Okay. Thanks, Chairman House. I, I would be in support of that too. I think the neighborhood associations do have a lot of value in our community, so it'd be nice to have them have some, some say or some seat at the table. Um, just another question, I guess, I'm having and a little bit of a struggle because it really went back and forth, and that's why we're discussing this today. But, um, you know, we had a little bit of a chat in, in Council Chambers one time when this is happening about how we have these opportunities to fund uh, groups through certain things, and maybe we switch the community group funding model to having it go through. Uh, arts development and pursuit of excellence and some of these other ones and the recommendation here is to actually remove those and I'm struggling a little bit with that because I I do think that when you have committees that, that actually have 
uh, cash attached to them. It's easier to get people to want to participate in beyond committees when they're actually feeling like they're spending the city's money, so to speak. And so I'm, I'm struggling a little bit if, if we remove those that we're maybe missing something in the community that way of allowing people to be involved in decision making. Um, and I'm also struggling if we did that. Um, it feels like we do that and community group funding has to stay similar. So can you maybe explain to me how we see community group funding going? Is it still staying as a separate bucket moving out of this that has nothing to do with this? Or just a question for administration how we see that coming out of this. Arlene or Jean? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would defer any questions with regard to community group funding to Director Miller. Thank you. <laughs> Can you answer Director Miller? Are you on the line? Uh, thanks, uh, Chairman Haas. Uh, and uh, sorry, I was a little bit. Uh, wasn't paying 100% attention, but I'm hoping that Katie can maybe respond to this. So I just, mm. was just dealing with another issue. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Hello. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Huss. So my understanding from the question is how community group funding fits in with the boards and committees. Is that correct? Yeah, and I, I guess, Katie, just to, to make it a little bit more clear, I mean, this is maybe an offline conversation that I thought Council had had a little bit of attraction around it. It didn't really. It doesn't line up with this. And it was like maybe instead of us doing community group funding the way we're currently doing it, is what if we said let's allocate more money to pursuit of excellence, and then anything that would have gone, come to a sports association community funding would be funding through that. There's some of the items through there that get like marching band. Maybe that goes to uh, the arts development committee and goes through that committee instead. And so I'm just trying to figure out if. if the community group funding is always going to have to stay in the current process or if it somehow is going to layer into these committees that we would be approving? Uh, through the chair, uh, I believe community group funding is still attached to a council policy. So when we return back to um, the CCW next month with changes to the policy, I believe you would change that there. Um, Arlene could correct me on that one if I'm wrong, but as, as far as I understand with community group funding, it's still a, it's a policy uh, through council that council approved. So I don't know that we could change that now. As far as POE and arts, I think we could make recommendations as well at that CCW to uh, modify some of the current applicants with community group funding to go to POE and arts if we, or if council chooses to keep them. Okay, and I guess that's the conversation we have to have is are, are those those ones I'm struggling with, I guess, for me to approve this today is I'm struggling with pursuits and arts development being uh, cancelled, and they see those as opportunities for the community involved. So that, that's just my piece. So I guess we'll, we'll hear what the rest of the video has to say this morning. But thanks for the response. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dylan? Great. Uh, thank you. Um, my, I got one thought and then a couple of questions. My big thought is I really do hope we have a lot more conversations about neighborhood associations where I really think that we as a city are dropping the ball with them in many ways. And I don't think that's our staff dropping that ball. I think that our staff that work with them are doing a great job. Okay. I think it really is council not having a clear vision of what role they have in our city. And I think we as council have some work to do on that. So I hope that's a conversation that we have, that we take seriously and we have soon. Although I respect why administration is saying it doesn't fit in this bylaw due to them being separate societies that's a good nuance to have in mind um two i guess the big question i had for our for legislative services and uh was around task forces and i noticed that the first time that this bylaw came before our committee there was the ability of council to form a task force and a change i noticed was now council upon the recommendation of the mayor can form a task force and i'm just wondering why that upon the recommendation of the mayor got added in Arlene? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, discussion at the April 14th committee meeting actually uh, was more specific to um, including the mayor as a separate entity to develop a task force. And the previous version of this draft bylaw uh, only allowed council to establish a task force. So it was um, amended at the request of the committee to include the mayor as a separate entity to um, establish a task 
enforced or as written uh, upon recommendation by the mayor, um, council could also establish a task force. So I so guess that's what, where that came. So I guess what my concern is is I've got no worries about this with our current council and mayor given because we've got a great working relationship. But I think part of our job is to think about the future council that might not have that same good working relationship. And if there were, if council was at odds with the mayor. Um, what my worry is with this bylaw is what if council says, hey, we want to form a task force, but the mayor says, no, I'm mm -hmm. not going to make that recommendation. Is that meaning the council doesn't actually have that power to work on its own without the mayor, mayor's support? Through the chair, the council is always as an assembly. Um, it acts as a group. So it would support our current procedure bylaw to enable this council to act as an assembly and make any action that um, based on quorum and based on motions carried can take act action. So if in fact, and I hope it never happens, we, we have a, a council that is um, contrary with a member of the council, um, that that would not stop this or any other council from taking action as an assembly that they would support. Great, thank you. All right, Council uh, uh, Clyde and then uh, Jackie. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Minhasa. I'll just check with Councillor Clayton if her uh, question relates to the current thread of discussion, perhaps she should go first because I'm going to change the subject. Oh, thank you. Okay. Does, yeah. Thanks, uh, Chair Minhas. Um, following on, I have other questions that I can go after uh, Councillor Blackburn, but uh, on the stream of Councillor Bressy's comments, um, I guess my concern with item three, uh, with the authority for the mayor to create a task force, is um, under what. Um, uh, as it's worded there, what um, opportunity is there for council to maybe be part of that decision? Um, and not our current mayor, but if a mayor in the future chose to create a task force on a, an item that maybe wasn't a council strategic priority, um, is, that, um, is that, you know, within the authority based on how the wording is here, is my question. Ms. Kavrzewski. Thank you, Chairman Ha. Uh, you're correct, Jackie. This does give um, a member of our council, specifically our chief elected official, more authority to um, make an action or do an action than um, the council as a whole. And um, in in the terms that you're speaking, if if there were in the future, a council con with contrary members, this may pose an issue. Yes, this is definitely worth consideration. Thank you. So um, when we get to the sort of uh, debate and discussion on the motion, um, I'll get to that. But I have um, Chair Black or Councilor Blackburn, if you have um, different questions, mine are different as well, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Minhas. So um, I have two concerns that I wanted to get some questions or ask a couple of questions on. Uh, one, uh, Arlene, is along the lines of the questions that Councillor Palat asked. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm uncomfortable with the um, uh, deletion of the Arts Development Committee and the Community Enhancement Advisory Committee. I've been involved in both of those and uh, I appreciate the enthusiasm of the public members who feel that they have an opportunity to participate along with uh, City Council in uh, making decisions that affect uh, uh, everyday life and the enhancement of, uh, of, our, of our community. And um, so I, I don't understand the justification for uh, deleting those two committees. Um, if you wouldn't mind responding to that one, then I'll get to my other question. 
Arlene, you going to move on to this one? Or? Thank you, Chair Minha. And to Councillor Blackburn's question, with regard to the Community Enhancement Advisory Committee, I'll, I'll address that one, one first, and it may also help to support your second um, issue. We, we revised the Community Enhancement Advisory Committee's mandate and changed the name of the committee to an all-encompassing community advisory committee and included in their mandate um, recreation and culture, um, engagement activities such as the beautification and community pride and events that had currently existed in the Community Enhancement Advisory Committee. So we've brought in the scope of that committee to, to have a, a more substantial mandate and more roles and duties that would engage with, with the city. And this is where, with regard to recreation and culture, we, we, could, we could evolve this committee in, in providing um, perhaps, and I'm hoping I'm not speaking out of turn, but um, the funding that, that um, council members are looking for with regard to sport development, recreation, and arts development, and, and use this committee as a, as a venue for, for the funding um, engagement piece. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my, my other question, um, I, I didn't do as much research as I should have, so forgive me if this information is already available, but I see that the uh, airport commission and the library are uh, being defined as uh, committees of council. Um, I don't think in our current practice we treat them as committees of council, and, uh, and they certainly have a great deal of independence in terms of, uh, um, uh, or in comparison to some of our other committees that are committees of council. And we've, even in our reporting, we've re we've uh, reported back to council uh, as these being external committees. Uh, and so I'm wondering, uh, is this a change? And if so, why? It just doesn't seem practical to me. Yeah. Yeah. Arlene? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So within this amalgamated bylaw for boards and committees, we have assigned that definitions to, to be able to um, address some of the general terms and general requirements that typically fall within every um, mandated bylaw or terms of reference or articles of incorporation that we develop for these separate entities. And the airport commission is a separate entity in that it's, um, it's, it belongs to us as a city but it's incorporated. It's an article. It's it's established through an Articles of Association, and that's a um, that's an authority that comes from the MGA. And with that, we develop a bylaw. So there's there's these pieces of legislation that are required specific to entities, uh, such as the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board, which is a quasi judicial entity that has a significant amount of authority to make decision and it, it's based out of the Municipal Government Act and therefore we must establish it by its own bylaw. Um, this amalgamated boards and committees bylaw uh, just brings the general terms of, of all of these approved and established entities into one one place, one centralized location, so that as a council, you can, you can review these annually or every four years. Um, you can review them separately, but as a whole, they're more accessible and, and more available for the community, for administration, and for our council. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I guess the, the, the 
general gist of the question is, are we changing anything in the way that we practically deal with these two committees as a result of this change? Uh, thank you through the chair. We are not changing their scope. We are just including them um, as part of this. We're bringing them into our community of, of established entities. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? If, uh, let's see. And Jackie. Thanks, Chairman Has. Uh, echoing uh, or following on Councillor Blackburn's comments in the dissolution of the four listed uh, committees there. I'm wondering if you could tell me um, how operationally, and we may have discussed this a while ago, but I can't seem to remember, uh, with the dissolution of Pursuit of Excellence, what that looks like with our regional partners as um, they contribute to um, this and, and like to be part of the discussion. So I'm curious uh, with dissolving it, uh, what the discussion has been with our regional partners in this. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, yeah. Those discussions were, um, I believe they were held with um, uh, the administrative manager and um, possibly the director of community services. So I would look to them for response. Thank you, Arlene. Yes, anything else? Uh, Chairman Huss? Go ahead, Arlene. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so our partner, uh, the County of Grand Prairie, does contribute $2,500. And uh, the thought is that that could still happen with uh, if we revised it uh, as suggested by Arlene. And uh, they could still be part of that process in the future, just under this uh, revised committee structure, if they're interested in being part of it. But we could certainly extend the invite to them. Oh, thank you. OK, if I can, I have a few other questions, Chairman. Has, um, to Ms. Karbyshewski, um, or possibly to the director, in the participation of external committees, it identifies uh, the AUMA board of directors, and um, it, it doesn't identify the FCM, the federal component, and I'm curious why it's even there. So this is an external organization that you would get elected to as a board of directors, and so I don't quite know is, is it there so that if you are missing council meetings because you are on the board, that it's considered council business? Um, and if so, great, but I think that we should add FCM as well. Okay, Arlene, you. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, the Schedule B um, listing under advocacy um, is entirely at the um, up to the decision of, of this council, what they want to see as um, groups or external boards that they feel that they're interested in. And if in fact um, there's a suggestion or a motion made to include further um, external um, partners, external interests, um, it would be up to this council to 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 um, decide decide and vote. What do you want to see on these lists? Uh, administration has taken the the current existing advocacy external boards that um, were identified at the April 14th uh, committee meeting, and it was requested that they be added to this list. So. Again, if there's any others that you feel need to be um, added to this, um, it is uh, at your discretion to make that motion and do so. Okay, when you refer to they want to see, do you mean they as an administration or they as in council? I'm sorry, they as in council. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I had one other uh, sure. question, but I think it can come during uh, motion and debate. Thanks, Chair Minhas. Thanks. So any other question for as it is, or we need the motion? Okay, Calvin and Eunice, can you make the motion? Okay, right, Eunice, go ahead. Um, yeah, so let's um, get this rolling then. I guess I'll uh, make a motion that committee recommend council give three readings to bylaw C, 
1422 being the boards and committees by law. Motion is on the table and uh, any discussion on this motion right now or are we gonna wait till the council? Mm, don't see any more. Councillor Minhas, Kevin, Councillor O'Toole would like to speak. Yeah, Kevin, go, go ahead, Kevin. Now you gotta turn the mic on. Boy, I was really going there for two. Uh, yes. Ms. Karpuszewski, thank you very much for your report. Uh, just one question uh, was mentioned during the Neighborhood Association uh, uh, conversation that you would suggest that we would recommend them having a seat on, was it the Community Advisory Board or which board was that? Uh, through the chair, you are correct. It was the Community, com community Advisory Committee. Okay. So uh, that's all the discussion. When this motion is passed, I would like to make another motion to include the Neighborhood Association in the Community Advisory Committee as having a seat, and that would be, uh, that would be my motion. At that okay, time. let's go to the first motion, or you want to amend this motion? No, we can do this after, I think, can't we? Yes. There you go. Uh, through the chair, uh, you can um, amend the motion if you so choose to give uh, to recommend council give three readings to this bylaw with an amendment, or you can just set aside that motion for a second, make yeah. an amendment motion, and then when you go to uh, recommend council give three readings to this bylaw you will recommend council give the three readings as amended. I will, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna go the first motion or amend this motion, how are we gonna do it? We'll do this one first. Okay, Junis had a motion on the table. Uh, any other question on it? Uh, I don't see. I don't see anybody, if it's nobody, all in favor. Motion carries. Okay, Kevin, you can make the second motion. Okay, I'd like to make a motion at this time uh, with an amendment to the previous one uh, that was made that uh, the representatives of the uh, neighborhood associations would vie for a seat on the community advisory committee. Thank you very much. It's motion one, on the table. One seat. One seat. Pardon? One seat. One seat. Motion on the table. Anybody had any question on the council? I don't see if I don't see it. Anybody? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, if, thank you for that motion, Councillor O'Toole, and I do appreciate <clears throat> the intent behind it, but I won't be supporting it. Reason being the um, community in this context really means the, the city as a whole. And my understanding of neighborhood associations and perhaps council needs to um, get a better uh, vision or, or better understand our vision of community associations, but they truly are for the neighbor or the neighborhood associations are truly for the neighborhood in which um, they um, exist. And unless we have opportunity for each neighborhood to be represented on this, Committee, I'm not sure that um, this really meets what I would like to see of the neighborhood association. Um, and, and I know too that this council is very good at recommending administration involve the, the neighborhood associations in decisions that are, are brought for council consideration or recommendations that are brought for council consideration. And um, I'd like to see that really strengthened, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not supportive of a single seat of a neighborhood association being representing on the, uh, on the community uh, you know, the, for the city as a whole. Thanks. Thank you, Junis. Uh, Kevin O'Toole? Uh, if you want to let Clyde speak first and then I'll finish. Oh, okay. 
Go ahead, Floyd. Thank you. Um, I'm, needless to say, I'm not on this committee and I can't have uh, a vote, but uh, if I might have some influence, I tend to agree with uh, Councillor Friesen on, uh, on her reasoning for not supporting the motion. Um, our neighborhood associations, uh, to varying degrees, are, are successful and uh, provide a, a good uh, service to the uh, parts of the community that they exist in. And we do have our liaison with those committees, which I understand at the moment uh, is um, uh, not at full force. However, I expect that uh, eventually we will be back to full force there. And, and I think that the neighborhood associations already have their opportunity to have um, input to council and, um, and to bring forth uh, uh, either concerns for individual communities or uh, some concerns that may go across all of the associations. Um, and, and I think that what's incumbent upon us as a council is to ensure that that uh, um, communication line is open. Um, and, and I would really encourage the committee to, to look at the, the concept of making sure that uh, our community associations can remain viable and have open communication with council. So uh, that's my Thank thoughts you. on it. Thank you. Mike Warren and uh, Governor Tool, you're going to. Let Dylan speak. Dylan? Yeah, thank you. Just something I push back a little bit about is the idea of that, um, that there's a temporary reduction in resources for neighborhood associations. I realized that over the last couple of months in light of COVID, there's been temporary resource reductions in them. But over the course of our term, there's been permanent resource reductions to them, where we used to have a full-time a full staff member dedicated uh, supporting neighborhood associations and I suggest that in many ways that was inadequate and over the course of this term we've added things my understanding anyways is that we've added things to that staff members portfolio so I think that we actually have given them less resources over the course of this term that we saw than we saw previous previously and I think one of the things that we as a city used to do a good job with neighborhood associations is drawing them together semi-regularly semi so they could talk with one another and they could share areas of mutual concern. And we don't do that anymore because we haven't had the staff resources for it. So without, my worry about this motion is right now neighborhood associations don't really talk to each other. Some talk to each other organically, but we're doing nothing to help draw them together and help them come with common cause. So the fact that we as an organization have made the decision to stop talking to them holistically, I don't know how, know how we possibly pick a representative of them. If we were still at that place where we were regularly gathering them, we'd say, hey, can you guys together suggest a representative for you guys? But there's no process like that right now. So I don't know how we hope to get them represented on this advisor, advisory board. So I think we need to do a lot more for neighborhood associations, and I'd like their voice to be part of this advisory board. But I just don't think this motion as it sits right now really works with our current practices in the city as they are. Thank you, Dylan. And anybody else I can see? No. Oh, yeah, Kevin, now you got to get going. Okay, so uh, just the background the neighborhood association started as a kind prevention a neighborhood watch type thing, and that worked out really well. And then because of there's so much involvement, it morphed and it become more and more and more. Uh, there's lots of things that were going on. Some neighborhood associations just wanted to be the the, the eyes on the street and they just wanted to report uh, possible crimes uh, that are in in the situation or break-ins to their neighbors uh, others decided that they wanted to have more of a social gathering they wanted to have meet and greets and block parties and garage sales and all that kind of stuff which is all fine uh, i really truly think that uh, if the neighborhood associations want to just sort of sit back and take the lower end of the of the scale and just be a neighborhood watch uh, eyes and ears for the police and bylaw then that's fine but there are some out there that really want to get involved they really want to beautify their neighborhood they really want to do a lot of things i can tell you there's neighborhoods that have developed parks there's some that put flags up representing their area 
I was on the Avondale one. We did a lot of things there back then when I was on the board. But in the end, I think that if the neighborhood associations want to have a representative, they could lobby amongst themselves and they could uh, have a technically a vote and suggest to that council that this would be their representative. That's my opinion, but I really truly think that they should have a seat on this and I don't think we need to have, I think there's 21 neighborhood associations in Grand Prairie or close to that number. I don't want to have 21 people on this board plus the regular board members that would be chosen. So uh, I would really, really like to uh, have this go through. Uh, we can make the changes as we need. We've morphed before, we will morph after. And uh, I really think that uh, this would be the benefit to the community. These are people that are uh, in the neighborhoods. They know what's going on. They know what's, what they would like to have. And uh, please, I would like to support. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, Lynn, can we read this motion like how it says, the wording, please? Uh, through the chair, I would ask Amanda Van Beekveld if she could review the motion for the committee. Thank you, Chair Minha. I have committee recommend the terms of reference of the community advisory committee be amended to include one representative from a neighborhood association. Thank you very much. So any other question on this motion? Babe, you go ahead. Thanks, Chairman Huff. Um, I, I'm so on this one too. I really appreciate Councilor O'Toole's intent and I would love to have your voice. My problem is, is we're gonna put one voice on this board that's not a board set up to do that. And so I, I feel like we're literally just trying to find a way for the neighborhood associations to be part of a conversation but I don't know if that's the conversation we want to be part of and not support the right venue. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with that. I think if we're looking at how to get neighborhood associations involved, kind of to Councilor Bussey's point, I think we have to have a conversation specifically about neighborhood associations and not try to just um, find a way to get their name and their face at the table somewhere. And I, and I think as much as the one person would be okay, I, I don't know. And, and to Councilor O'Toole, I, I love that you're trying to get this out there because I know you, your intentions are 100% honorable on this and you want to get this ball rolling and, and we can morph and roll with the changes. I'm just worried we're going to create more work down the road trying to morph than if we just literally push a pause button on this and figure out how we get neighborhood associations involved and what that looks like beforehand. Um, I also don't like the idea of only one person being there from neighborhood associations. I think that's a, that's a hard one for me. Of, you know, you got some people who would love to be on a board and then they get told no because only one got to go through. So I'm just struggling with it, uh, Kevin, to be honest. And I, I wanted something there. I'm just struggling with this one with only one person being there. Thank you, Wade. Any, oh, anybody else on the queue? I don't see it. So if it's not, then I think I'm gonna support this Sorry, one. I Councillor Midhas, I was. Oh, you were? Okay, sorry, I missed you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, something that, uh, something that an idea is maybe the, maybe what, maybe what it is, is, um, I get that we don't want this, that this advisory committee does so many other things, but maybe there is an opportunity to have a different advisory committee that specifically is for neighborhood associations where we have, whether it gets together quarterly or twice a year or what, or once a year, but maybe there's a, maybe we establish an official body where each neighborhood association can send one person to that body and then that might be a way to form a committee that works within this bylaw because it's not like a neighborhood association it's not a standalone society it's a city established thing and we'd be recognizing in this bylaw hey neighborhood associations are part of our community people we want to we want to hear from but we'd allow them to nominate their own people to it that might be a solution that we use all right thank you is anybody else on it uh i don't see it now oh kevin go ahead uh, just in regards to what Mr. Bressy had to say, that was my 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 uh, idea behind it. I think the neighborhood associations, those that want to get involved, will be involved, and uh, we can work with them down the road. And uh, I truly believe that uh, they will want to get together and come up with uh, solutions that are happening and to problems. And uh, they would be our communication. And that one individual that's appointed 
would be able to represent all of the neighborhood associations. They're already talking now. They're already using Facebook and Snapchat and all that kind of stuff. I think that there's an opportunity there for this to really get big, uh, get bigger and get more people involved. So uh, say what you want, think what you want, but uh, the things that we used to do last year are different than we do this year. The, the boards have uh, changed from the very beginning to what they are now. Uh, we've had some issues uh, because of the global situation going on and uh, there's been staff reductions, there's been people that are unemployed and they don't have the time to be at these neighborhood associations. But I'm telling, I think we need to set it up uh, and have a starting point. We can always change. We can always change and we have always changed. So with that, I close. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the queue this time? Uh, Arlene? I, I know I, um, I'm i going to throw another idea at you um, as a committee and as a council. Um, if, if, in fact, uh, you would like to see neighborhood associations engage with this particular committee, uh, perhaps um, the neighborhood associations, instead of having a representative of one on the committee, we invite the neighborhood associations to meet with this committee as a delegation uh, on a semi-annual basis or some kind of uh, basis a couple of times of a year with just something to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Governor Tool, you're going to say something? Yeah. Yeah, if uh, my vote fails, which I hope it doesn't, I would, I would recommend that motion, or I'd recommend that the, the neighborhood associations meet as a committee so i would make that later if yes. i will Mr. happily Burke, you... motion if this uh if this fails. sorry chairman uh, you... happily follow up with that motion i think mm -hmm. that that's your way to get representation from all of the all of the neighborhood associations uh it provides them a place to uh come together and be heard which they don't have now. Um, I, th I think it's a, a better blanket way of hearing from them. Thanks. Okay, so we got the motion. Kevin's first motion. Kevin, you're going to say something? No, Mr. Burke wants to talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, this uh, definitely goes into another director's area, but another suggestion: should this should this motion fail, it's clear that there uh, there's some desire to have some further discussion, and I don't know if we have all the right people here to to, to have the relevant information to to give you the, the best proposals. Um, I would suggest um, that a follow up motion could be uh, for administration to bring back um, uh, this item at the appropriate venue within the next or before the uh, July break or in the next 60 days uh, to have a have a discussion on this uh, this item, where you could look at some of the alternatives and administration to provide some uh, some uh, more fulsome recommendations uh, verbally. After after this motion failed or after motion passed? Oh, I wouldn't pre prejudge which way this motion goes, but I was thinking, uh, should this motion fail? All right. Okay, Dylan, you're gonna say something? Yeah. Cover tool. So motion is on the table. All in favor? Uh, opposed? One opposed. Uh, so motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, too. Jackie Clayton wants to talk. Jackie, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a couple things. Uh, as I'm not on this committee, and I realize I voted earlier by accident, but uh, that uh, when it gets to council for consideration, um, uh, to just to sort of more of maybe a heads up for administration as well as council. I, I do want to have a further discussion on item number three under in the analysis in regards to um, the mayor uh, creating a task force. I also at council will want to have um, a discussion on the schedule B um, of adding uh, either adding FCM board of directors or removing AUMA board of directors. 
Um, I think uh, they either both need to be there or, or neither. Um, and then as well, I had a comment in sort of a, a process thing, um, and it may just sort of slipped with changes uh, within our organization, or there may have been direction from someone that, and I missed it. But uh, in the past, when we had drafts such as this, um, there, when it was brought to committee, and maybe not council level, but committee, changes that were made to these um, were um, highlighted uh, and in the existing policy so that you can see comparable. Um, I found this process, to be honest, a little bit onerous of going back, okay, well, this was removed, this used to be here, this was here. And so um, I'm just wondering if there um, is an opportunity, you know, when we do um, drafts such as this to show changes, if, if it's simple, um, you know, if it's an overhaul, fair enough, it's way too confusing. But if it's simple changes of, you know, this committee is struck and this committee is added, um, maybe we, it's something that we can continue to do again. Um, this one was quite a big one, so I'm, I'm sure it, it wasn't possible on this one. Um, and then the other item that at council level I'd like to have a discussion on is the pursuit of excellence. So uh, I'm not a uh, member of this committee, so I won't make, uh, be able to make any motions here, but I just wanted to give a heads up. Thanks. So anybody can, uh, Arlene or Shane, can you give a suggestion how we can do it? Uh, Jackie's motion, we can do it or we could wait till uh, the, you know, no? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with regard to how this particular document was presented today at committee, uh, because it isn't an existing bylaw, it, it, it's still in its draft format. So. Uh, we presented it as such. Um, going forward, if this bylaw to re were to be passed and subsequent amendments required, you would see that format where the existing bylaw as passed is this, and these are the highlighted changes and or re omissions or additions. And um, I, I promise you, you'll, you'll see a, a continuation of that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Arlene. And I believe May uh, Director Miller would like to speak. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Miller. Uh, thanks, Chairman Haas. Uh, so I just wanted to say that I, I did hear the conversation in the, about neighborhood associations and the POE as well. So uh, we'll find another venue. I know the manager for uh, SDWC is also listening in. We'll find a venue to to bring it back to a committee or council to have a further discussion on that as well. Thank you, Orlin. So anybody else on the queue right now missing? I don't see it. All right, if it's not, then we move to the next item, 103. Council folks area, Mr. Shane. Um, actually, Chairman Haas, we need to vote on, do we not need to vote? I don't think we got a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm out of order. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is the right time or not, but I'd like to make a motion that the Community Advisory Board uh, send an invitation to all of the neighborhood associations to meet at least once a year uh, with their board. Any, is that the motion you're putting in, Kevin? Yes. Any debate on this motion? Dylan, go ahead. My apologies, I had one of those internet hiccups, so I actually missed the motion. Could Councillor Sewell just say it again? I move that uh, the Community Advisory Board send an invitation to all of the neighborhood associations to meet at a regular meeting uh, at least once a year. All right, you're going to go ahead, Dylan, say something on it? Yeah, and for me, I can't vote today. I think that would be something that would be unlikely to vote a council in terms of, I like the intent of it, of saying, hey, we want to give a formal venue for these neighborhood associations. But the idea of 
Hey, council is going to ask neighbor associations to meet with an advisory board to us. Just too many layers of separation from us where I'd really like us to figure out how can we have a direct, how can we have a direct conversation with neighbor associations? And that could be, like I said, that could be an advisory board meet up out of all of them. Maybe that's us as counselors make an effort to between the nine of us or the eight of us, we make an effort to visit every neighborhood association once, twice a year. There's a bunch of different ways we can do that. But I really think that we should be working to have a direct tie-in with these neighborhood associations, not just asking them to meet with an advisory body that advises us. Okay, anybody else on the queue on this side? Uh, Clyde, go ahead. Then Eunice. Thank you, uh, Councilman Hess. I'm a little confused. I thought that the committee already approved um, the motion that Councillor O'Toole made to put a representative onto that committee uh, from the neighborhood associations. And so this seems to me to be a, a, a redundant suggestion. Number two. Well, the request was to have all the members of the neighborhood associations meet the community advisory board uh, so they feel they all have an equal say, uh, not just represented by one person. And uh, they can talk about what's unique about their neighborhoods uh, rather than one person uh, bringing it on and hearing it. I think it's an opportunity for all the neighborhood associations to speak, highlight their past year, and uh, I think this is an opportunity. Uh, I'm also suggesting that they also come to council at least once a year as well, but I haven't got that far yet. All right, uh, Junis. Thank you, Councilor Minhas. I'm not going to support this motion today, and I only because. I really think that we as council need to sit down and go, okay, do we, what, what do we, what um, can we do for neighborhood associations? We have removed some resources from them. Do we value them or don't we value them? And if we do, and I think that we should, then let's put some time into really understanding how best we can support them going forward. And this may be it, but it also might not be it. So I, I would rather get a good understanding of what it is and how council wants to support neighborhood associations before we go deciding how and to whom neighborhood associations are going to meet and, and you know, give reports to and that sort of thing. So today I, I won't support this. And, and again, not because it, it may be what we land on in the end. I'm just not convinced it is the best way today. No, thank you very much, Eunice. Anybody else in the queue? If nobody else on the queue, or uh, I can't see anybody. Okay, nobody else on the queue. I got to say, girl, too. I'm having a hard time to supporting this motion also because we don't, we can't compel. They come to our meeting every once a year for sure. I don't know this is right or wrong, but uh, I'm getting hard time to support this one. Kevin, two. Well, friends off then. No, that's fair enough. It's a democratic society. It's an idea. Uh, we've got to start somewhere. Uh, we were talking to uh, Mr. Miller. He said he's got to have a uh, uh, something in the next little while to talk about these two items that we had been discussing, and I'm okay with that too. It's just that I wanted to know that uh, I wanted to let people know that I'm very supportive of the neighborhood associations. They are a huge part of our community, and we need to treat them right. And this is baby steps. And like I said, it's going to morph. What's, this, what's, what's good this year may not be good for next year. It may need to add some more or take some away. So uh, thank you. Thank you. So anybody else want to speak on it yet? Or, uh, I don't see Chris. You're very quiet this time. But... Okay. No, I'm, I'm here. I'm just enjoying the conversation. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay, if nobody's on, then uh, motion on the table. All in favor? Kevin O'Toole. Opposed? Don't think motion. Motion didn't carry. Go ahead, Eunice. Thank you. Can I follow up with the motion that um, 
committee asked administration to come back with a report on how we may better engage neighborhood associations with um, the priorities of council, how, so just generally speaking, how, how we might better hear from them, better support them, um, how, how can we really make the best of a good thing that we've got going on in Grand Prairie with these, um, how many did you say, Councillor O'Toole? I think you said 40? No, there's not that many. I think there's, it's yeah, around 20. 20, okay, 20 um, neighborhood associations. So I, I'd like to put that motion there. Uh, uh, Chairman Boss? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So uh, as Councillor O'Toole did state, uh, we. You know, on behalf of admin, we are committed to bringing back uh, more information to uh, committee or to council about the associations. We have had a, a bit of a gap in that that person has been away for a period of time already and, and is still away for another month. But uh, in the meanwhile, I'll commit that uh, Katie and uh, Stephanie and, and the existing team that we do have right now with the layoffs that we did uh, go through, we will find a venue to bring back information to uh, council. Either it'll be strategic priorities or a different venue, maybe even through community services committee, but we'll have a discussion and uh, and get uh, additional thoughts. We we do recognize neighborhood associations are very important in the community as well, and uh, and we'll give them more attention in the near future. Thank you, Alan Mill. Uh, sorry, Mr. your first part. You're saying we don't need the this motion, or it's already included in the Kevin's motion. That's what you meant. Uh, are you asking Councillor Friesen or myself? No, yourself, like you mentioned, you know, already. Oh. Yeah, well, I, I think even without the motion, if the uh, committee's okay with that, we will certainly, we will uh, bring back information to committee uh, soon or to council. That's clear. Go ahead, Jim. In which case, then, thank you. Thank you, Director Miller. I'll withdraw the motion. Thank you very much, Eunice. So that is done. So anything else on the neighborhood association C1222 more? I think at this time, I don't see anybody. If somebody see it, let me know, please. If it's not, then we move on to 103, council folks on the area. And uh, Shane Brooks, this is your term again. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman Haas. Um, uh, in the report, uh, you'll see um, um, the council focus areas chart. Uh, this brings together um, all of the direction that uh, council have given us over the past couple of years, as well as the uh, identifies the priorities that administration are working on to deliver on on those priorities. Um, you can look at this as a this isn't new information, but this, you can look at this as a report card uh, for administration to council and also council and administration to the community. It highlights uh, the initiatives that we're we're working on. Uh, just I uh, won't go through all of the report, but it does outline uh, the three uh, main priorities of Council, which are affordable housing, revenue diversification, and community engagement, and an additional six items they'd like us to be working on, which are community pride, service delivery review, regional partnerships, financial management, asset management, and social impacts. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, one thing I would do is in the recommendation, it asks us to bring this back uh, quarterly uh, through the remainder of your term. And I think it's important that we get uh, that direction to continue with this process as this is the first time we've presented this uh, in public in this uh, exact format. Sorry, you're on mute, uh, Chairman Haas. Sorry, Chairman Haas, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Go ahead, uh, Junit. Thank you. I have a question for Director Burt. Um, so will this, I quite like how this is laid out. It seems uh, very clear. The, I, I like the, the layout of it. And, um, you know, and the on-hold in progress completed as well as the little bit of detail that's in there. So will this be readily available on the website for the for the public? You said this is kind of the first time it's been presented in public, but will it until each subsequent quarterly update be available on the city website so that some any resident could come in and have a look at it? 
uh, through the yes. chair. Um, uh, yes, this will be posted, uh, available online uh, and uh, available for review. And it's uh, it's a uh, evolving document. Changes though will will come to committee before they're posted on on the website. So committee will see it first before uh, it's updated on the website. But it'll be a, a legacy document uh, for people to to track our progress. Thank you. Is there any more question for uh, Director Sheen? Go, uh, go ahead, Clyde. Thank you, Councillor Minhas. Um, I, I really like this document. Um, it, it tries to be an at-a-glance kind of uh, format. However, it does contain a lot of detail and uh, involves a lot of reading. So I would just either ask or suggest that when we get a quarterly update, that there be some way to highlight changes so that um, they're easier to find. After the chair, uh, we will. Uh, we have discussed that. We will. Uh, I'll formalize that though, and make sure that they're clearly identified uh, going forward. Good. Good suggestion. Thank you. Shane Brook is. Uh, anybody on the queue? Kevin too. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do want to comment that uh, this is just a good news story that we get to see some completed uh, status on here. Uh, I like the format and uh, the detail is pretty good and uh, I see that there's a lot of things that are in progress which is good and it'll always be in progress because it's a reporting tool but uh, yeah uh, hats off I'm glad to see this very much take care are you putting the motion on or I mean recommendation well uh, just a motion to accept this uh, this focus areas uh, update. Okay, thank you. Uh, Junus, go, you go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was just gonna offer to make a, a motion, um, but it, I think Director Bork did ask for the direction to um, bring it quarterly to the appropriate standing committee as well. So I'm, I'm not sure if we wanna put that in the same motion. Uh, so anybody suggest how we should do is amend the motion or? Carry the motion the way it is. Director uh, Shane Brook, you the widest? If if I were to offer a recommendation, it uh, would be as uh, stated in the report, uh, which is to um, um, provide quarterly updates of the council focus areas of this council's term to the appropriate standing committee quarterly. Um, so I, I, we would I would recommend that you direct us to do this quarterly. Okay, then I'll do that. Then. Put it in there, right? Sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah. I'll I'll make the motion that's recommended uh, in the report. Okay, motion is on the table. And Junis, any question on the motion? If it's not, then all in favor. Motion carried unanimously. And uh, next question is, are we gonna talk about Casey or will they talk enough for the neighbor association, the delegation? Because I think Dylan had a question that time he wants to carry on. No. Dylan, did you say something about this uh, delegation part? No, Mr. Chair, I wanted to make sure we had a good discussion about neighbor associations, and we definitely had that, and it's going to be continuing. So I'm very happy, but I appreciate you checking in on me. Thank you very much. So if it's not that, and then we move on to outstanding items. Uh, uh, thank you. This is you again. Thank you, uh, Chairman Haas. Um, updates are that uh, 1088 is on track uh, to have another discussion about uh, AUMA resolutions at the June 9th meeting. Um, 1078 uh, has been completed, um, or at least for as far as moving it through this committee. I would uh, suggest that it, uh, it could be taken off, but I would defer to the committee on that. Uh, 1080 budget 2020 has been uh, completed and the mill rate has been set. And uh, 1041, the clerk assures me that uh, that is on track uh, for the June 9th meeting as well. Uh, so I would uh, take advice on whether 1078 is completed as far as the purpose of the committee or not. Thank you, Shane. And uh, so do we need motion on 
outside uh, or any question on it. Kelvin, go ahead. Just, just a matter of convenience, we are going to be talking about the boards and committees later. So I think this can come off. And uh, I would make a motion to accept the outstanding items listed uh, as changed. And uh, here we go. Move Thank the motion to approve the, the outstanding items. Yep. Yeah. Motion on table, all in favor? Motion carried. And with that, I think we're done for uh, Cooperative Society. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, uh, the uh, the person that I can't think uh, Casey from the community yeah. group association that she gave her uh, delegation uh, yeah delegation today so and we accept that oh thank you very much yeah I forgot sorry about that so motion on table all in favor carried. Thank you. So with that, we, now we're done, Kevin, or anything else? <laughs> Thank you. We are done, and I think now is uh, Wade, your turn. Thanks, Jack. Uh, so yeah, we'll switch into the uh, Protective and Social Services Committee agenda for today, um, and we'll start off with, with Director Emanuel's uh, presence with our uh, verbal update from our director. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, um, Chair Pilat. It's Wendy Hughes here. I will be uh, presenting the updates um, as Director Emanuel has a scheduled appointment today and sends his regrets. So I'll begin with uh, CSC. Uh, a virtual community coffee was held on May 7th with 31 in attendance and again on May 14th with 25 in attendance. The next scheduled meeting will be held on May 28th at 10 a.m. The Grand Spirit Foundation has lifted restrictions on senior facilities so for further increase of home support was implemented on May 26th from a centralized housing first assessment to the coordinated access model. This new model has eliminated wait lists for clients as agencies work together to assess needs. The biannual Seniors Key event is going virtual to recognize Seniors Week on June 5th to June, sorry, rather June 1st to June 5th. This event is a partnership with the County of Grand Prairie FCSS, Beaver Lodge, Wembley, Heights, and Seniors Outreach. Activities will include registering for a small gift to be delivered to seniors, and a streaming of musical performances on June 5th at 1.30 p.m. on the Seniors Outreach Facebook page. In enforcement, full-time bike patrols are well underway with a four-officer unit. Many interactions are occurring with positive feedback received from citizens and the media. Traffic enforcement officers are phasing back to enforcement. A safe working procedures have been developed and implemented. Traffic infraction rates increased significantly since the suspension of regular enforcement operations due to COVID-19. However, because of recent efforts, numbers are expected to seasonally normalize. For GPREP, the Emergency Management Act amended the sole renewals, which will now be effective for 90 days instead of seven days. Playgrounds are scheduled to reopen on June 1st and GPREP is developing signage for all municipalities, which will be posted to encourage social, social distancing, hand hygiene, and will out, outline COVID-19 risk mitigation recommended, recommendations to be regarded at the discretion of parents and users. Planning is also underway to scale back the ECC operation. Plans will also include the trigger points for reopening if or when necessary. The fire department has utilized this time during the COVID-19 pandemic to work on online training and the implementation of new standard operating procedures. 
And lastly, the RCMP have increased patrols to the downtown core in response to recent local business concerns. And this concludes the PSS update. All right, thanks for that, Wendy. Uh, any questions, questions for the Councilor Bresley? Great, thank you. Thank um, you. Um, question about question the about local, local emergency, emergency in the 90 90 90 90 90 90 90 legislation. Sorry, I'm not understanding. Sorry, not understanding. The, uh, the legislation passed for a while, 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 but has Jucreps declared for 90 days, or is that in fact Jucreps having that? Councilor Bresley, I'm sure but I'm getting a lot of feedback uh, here and it's pretty muffled when you said it's so about just me, but it was. Uh, I suggest uh, that Wendy needs to mute her micro or her uh, microphone until uh, the question's been asked. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Blackwood. And, and so same for Great. Is this better? Awesome. Uh, just my question is about the state of local emergency and the change in provincial legislation allowing it to be for 90 days. I wasn't clear on. Um, are you saying that that's that that's an option that GPREP's discussing now, or GPREP has declared it for the next 90 days? Thank you, Chair the Chair Pilat. Um, so it is my understanding that the SOL is, is now in effect for 90 days. Um, so we will be required to determine the duration of the SOL, which can be extended up to 90 days. So, Sorry, by default right now, if no more action is taken by GPREP, is it lasting 90 days right now, or does GPREP need to take more action to make it last 90 days? It lasts 90 days. So I guess my question is, I don't know if it's for administration or or committee, but I'm trying to figure out, um, or maybe it's for Council Clayton, who's our representative on GPREP. I'm just trying to figure out, um, I don't know if, if I support it for the next 90 days. And I know that there's ways that we can, I know that legislation allows us to have a, have a different take and end a state of the local emergency, but I'm just kind of curious where the conversation is at and when our council, not just GPREP, is gonna touch it or if there's plans to let us touch it. Councillor Clayton, did you wanna jump yeah, in Yeah, sure, that? thanks, Chair Plot. Um, I really appreciate this question because um, the last two weeks, the meetings have simply just been removed from our calendar. So the discussion at an elected official level has been removed. It's, it's truly just using the legislation to keep the soul in place based on uh, GPREP's um, opportunity to do, use the legislation for this. And right now there's no elected official discussion at the table. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Councillor Platt. Um, <clears throat> I I know that there are some sensitivities over uh, whether or not a state of a local emergency should remain in effect, but I don't see a lot of risk with it, regardless of how long it lasts, because if we don't exercise any of our um, rights under that um, uh, under that state of local emergency, then um, it really has no effect on the community but it does provide us with the opportunity at a moment's notice if something does arise uh, that, that we can deal with it. So uh, I, I don't have a concern with it carrying on. Uh, Chair Plot, if I can just continue to that. Um, at, the, at the last GPREP meeting, the discussion around the soul was based on a needs assessment of PPE uh, to prepare for the phase one openings where we were concerned about um, as restaurants and retail, et cetera, it got open, that all of a sudden it wouldn't turn into a toilet paper issue, that there was a shortage of PPE in the community. Um, I haven't, because there hasn't been a uh, meeting per se with elected officials at, I don't have an update in regards to what the numbers of PPE are. And um, yeah, I can't really, so from a committee perspective, um, we're not having the meeting, so I don't have any information, thanks. Um, I can comment on the, the sole duration. Go ahead, your uh, CEO. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Chair Pilat. So I just got a, an update here from uh, Jennifer Wood at GPREP and the uh, um, 
The current situation is that the SOL is in place for 90 days, uh, so there is no need to, to renew anymore now. However, uh, it's at the chief prep discretion to lift the state of local emergency at any time without that, that window. So if the situation evolves and is more positive and we see positive change in two weeks, in three weeks, in four weeks, at any point, uh, we, can, we can lift the state of local emergency. Um, but in the current situation is, is in place for up to 90 days right now. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Councilor Bressi. Yeah, and I think where I'm getting really uncomfortable with this is that I think that it's interesting. I think GPREP has been a very good organization for a lot of the emergencies we faced in the past. I think we're definitely seeing right now a challenge. It's got challenges in the current circumstance. And I think a big concern I've got is that GPREP meetings aren't public meetings in terms of the public doesn't, I don't, I'm not even clear if the public can go to a GPREP meeting if it wants to, but we certainly don't advertise when they happen. They're certainly not recorded. The public certainly can't see what happened. And I'm really concerned that we're in this decision for the first 90 days. And we as elected officials have delegated very substantial powers to administration without having public debate and without having a, pub, a public vote. And I don't even know if I'm opposed to having the state of emergency for the next 90 days, but I'm gravely concerned with it happening in a sort of non-public manner. And I don't know, for me, I really think that this is something that we should be talking about. How do we have a public vote and a public conversation conversation this in these extraordinary times. I'm not comfortable it being done on a regional basis in a non-public meeting, frankly. Uh, I'll just jump off with you in a second, Councillor Clayton. I'm just, I, I have the same concerns as Councillor Bressy. I just think it's uh, it's a little scary to just have this not be in our calendars anymore, not having council discuss this. We, we had a discussion about three weeks ago, a month ago as a council about whether we should renew it. And I'm a little bit apprehensive that now we've basically got something that's in place for 90 days. Yes, we can talk about it, but I don't know where it enters our agendas if we want to have a discussion about that. And so maybe administration can let us know if, if there's a plan that, that our council is going to be having a conversation about this um, to, to keep to, to, to be working with GPREP. But I, I'm with Councillor Bressy. I think it's kind of scary that we're kind of in the dark on this all, all together. So. Uh, is administration having a plan to having a conversation with council about state of emergencies moving forward, or are we just letting G prep uh, dribble the ball? Now? So I'm not sure if that's a, uh, a Wendy question or a Director Galati or a CAO Galati question, but I'm just wondering where, where administration is at with, with council having conversations about the state of emergency. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair Pilat. So I'm, I'm in, com in communication now with uh, uh, Jennifer at GPREP. Um, my understanding is, um, yes, okay, so she confirmed that the group decided this. Uh, so I believe Councillor Clayton uh, was not on the, um, on the meetings, uh, the, last, the last meeting, I believe, or the last two? No, I was there, but they got cancelled, removed from my calendar. Okay. So, so I guess the question, uh, to you, Juan, is, is our council going to be having a conversation about this at any point, or is this just going to continue to be in GPREP's hand and we hear about it in the, the same fashion that the community hears about it? Um, the, 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 the rule of thumb that we have been following after the, the first declaration of solid that you may recall um, that happened at the council chamber when we took the initiative as the city of Grand Prairie just by ourselves, to initiate the state of local emergency uh, in the morning. And I believe the following day, the rest of the GPREP members declare state of local emergency. After that, the decision was to, as a group, uh, as a unified voice to, uh, to continue with the, with the state of local emergency declaration. And that was following the, guide, the guidelines of the GPREP uh, mandate so we have a, a, an elected officials representation from the different communities. Um, and that, that was the case every seven days, I believe. Uh, and it's the case now. So the, the group met um, recently and, and, ex and decided to extend this. But again, the, the group can, can decide to lift uh, the soul or independently, we as the city can decide to lift the soul within the city limits. That's the other option as well that uh, you have as a council. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Clayton? Uh, thanks, Chair Plot. Um, and I guess my concern 
isn't um, what the organization ha actually has the authority to do. It's my concern is, is that as elected officials, we get um, the brunt of the feedback from the residents in the region. And so um, in my opinion, there was never even a discussion that elected officials were all of a sudden not gonna be part of the conversation. The, the invites just kept, the last two weeks have been removed from my calendar. So I don't know why or at what point we chose to stop inviting the forefront, the people that speak to everybody every single day from the conversation. Not even saying that I would or would not have supported the initiative to continue for 90 days, but I just think it's unfortunate that the uh, front-facing people were removed from the conversation. Yeah. Okay, I will check why uh, you didn't receive the invite, Councillor Clayton. Uh, any other questions for Wendy on this one? Uh, oh. All right. Chair Flack? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. If I can just add, uh, with the GPAIR process, I know that I think there's still two updates coming out to the elected officials uh, every week. And uh, at the bottom of that update, it still does name that I'm the, the point of contact for elect elected officials as a liaison rep. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, please. And uh, if you don't feel that you're getting the answers, or if you don't have the information, then just give me a phone call and I'll uh, track down the information. I know as uh, the city manager has mentioned, it is for 90 days, but administration has had discussions about at what point should we uh, end the soul. And, uh, and those discussions have been with the GPREP group as well. So I guess the information maybe hasn't been shared with the uh, council or with elected officials, but, uh, but we are debating. We also look at uh, throughout the province, what other communities still do have souls in effect. And I'm not aware of any that uh, have ended the soul at this point. I think uh, as was stated, there is still, still some value that if we do need it uh, for the authorities to take quick quick action that we can do that. But uh, but right now it's it's almost business as usual in a lot of aspects with the, the COT program and uh, and the PPE that we're acquiring. So but, uh, I hope that helps somewhat. But, uh, okay, thanks, thanks Director Miller. Uh, Councillor Clayton? Your mic is on, so. Just a question for CAO Galante, um, uh, and you may have already mentioned this, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but council at any time can um, make a decision to not be part of that uh, regional um, state of emergency, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Same situation as we decided initially when we declared Sole uh, just for the city uh, could be reverted uh, in a similar way. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, seeing no other further questions, I guess for me, uh, I'll leave it on. I'd sure love to see council be having a conversation about this at some point again, not just having this be in, the, in that hand. I think it's too front facing as Councillor Clayton kind of alluded to as well, um, for us not to be having a conversation about this periodically as well. So I'd sure love to have administration find a way to get in our calendars where our council's having a conversation about this and we fully understand it other than just getting an email reminder Kind of like the rest of the community is getting. I just I, I appreciate what GPREP's doing. I just I feel like we're we're a little bit in the in the dark on this one, and it's a little bit concerning as a council for, for me for sure. Um, sorry, Councilor Resnick. Yeah, I just take it on to that. I think I just want to be really clear that my concern is actually more the public facing side of it, where I'm actually pretty comfortable with the information and the information I've I've received and. I don't, and I don't think I've got problems with this whole being extended for 90 days. I think I support our direction, but for me, it's the fact that it's not happening in public votes and that we, I, I don't feel that I need more private information as a, as a counselor. I know how to access, how to access that, but it is the public debate that I specifically think is missing here. Thanks for that. Um, I see no other hands up here. So we'll move on to uh, our other business which we have none in our outstanding items list. So I'll ask Wendy to just uh, go through our outstanding items list, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Flott. Uh, so item number 1072, the vehicle for hire bylaw. Uh, we will be on track and prepared to bring that report forward on September 15th. And as well, item 1055, the traffic enforcement and efficiency is on track and as well will be reported on June 23rd. 
any questions regarding the outstanding items list? If not, I'd be looking for a motion on those. Councillor Thiessen, he's been quiet today. <laughs> I'm, yeah, you know, I decided to take a listen for a change. Um, yeah, I would move that we approve the outstanding items uh, uh, list as approved. As, it's not amended, so just approve it as it is. Okay, that works. Uh, I don't see a lot of discussion to me, so all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you for that. And uh, with that, I guess we're closed with our protectors and social services. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Chair Palat. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everybody. everybody. Have a, stay safe. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. So long, folks. Okay. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you.